we now move on to uh, stimulated uh, Raman scattering. Now, in this process, what happens is uh, you have, uh, I have already told you the difference between Raman and Brillouin scattering. Uh, in this process, uh, what happens is your incoming photon interacts with uh, the molecular uh, vibrations, right? The, it interacts with the silica molecule. So, you could have this photon whose uh, frequency is nu p absorbed by the molecule and you could have the scattered light which is coming out with a frequency nu s which is slightly smaller than the uh, incident nu p and the remaining nu p minus nu s would be absorbed by the molecular uh, energy states. So, essentially uh, molecular vibrational states will start getting populated because of this energy. This is molecular vibrational states. This is the Stokes process, uh, but there is also a chance that the atom is already in the uh, excited state. Uh, the molecules are already in the excited state because of some uh, thermal vibrations in the system. Uh, you have the, uh, uh, you know, the system already in the excited state, then it could ab ab absorb the pump photon and you could generate an uh, uh, anti-Stokes photon whose energy is, uh, whose energy is uh, larger than the incident pump photon because the molecular vibrations have actually given the energy to the pump photon. Both these processes are uh, possible. And one thing to notice is that, you know, I did not uh, draw it as a single line, I drew it as a band and this band is because uh, silica is actually uh, amorphous. So, these uh, vibrational states are not really uh, single states, you could have uh, distribution of vibrational states and that gives rise to a broader spectrum. So, similar to acoustic uh, phonons, uh, by the way these uh, phonons of uh, the quanta of these lattice vibrations or molecular vibrations in some uh, books are also called as optical phonons. Now, uh, this is a slightly misleading term because there is not, nothing optical about a phonon. It is a quanta of acoustic, uh, it is a quanta of molecular vibrations. The word um, optical came in because its frequency is uh, very, very large. So, so the, so the question is what is this frequency difference uh, uh, or how, how nu p minus nu s. Turns out that this frequency difference peaks at about 13 terahertz for silica. So, this is the frequency difference between the pump and the uh, stokes or the anti-stokes and the, uh, it turns out that the, since the silica, since silica is an amorphous material uh, and also that these uh, vibrational states depending on the lifetime of the vibrational states, it decays with a specific lifetime. So, similar to the uh, acoustic decay time which gave rise to a spread in the gain spectrum. Similarly, the uh, rise time of uh, the lifetime of this uh, vibrational states would give rise to the gain spectrum and this lifetimes are very, very short which gives rise to a large uh, gain spectrum uh, and this shape is not Lorenzian simply because I am, I am just drawing this as, uh, uh, I may, may, may not be representing it uh, exactly but it is something like this and it is not Lorenzian simply because it is an amorphous material, you, you cannot really uh, assign uh, only one kind of molecule in the whole system. So, each of the type of molecule will give rise to its own Lorenzian. So, uh, you will have a superposition of all that and uh, but the overall uh, lifetime is uh, sorry the width is about uh, 20 to 30 uh, terahertz. So, it simply means that the peak of the Stokes shift happens at about 13 terahertz uh, from your, from your uh, pump, right? And this difference is 13 terahertz 
and this 13 terahertz would correspond to roughly 100 uh, nanometer but the width of the gain spectrum it me it's about 20 to 30 terahertz it means that if i excite a system with a single frequency i could have stoke stokes photons uh, coming out as a result of scattering either in the forward direction or in the backward direction at any of these uh, frequencies okay and since this is an interaction directly with the molecules of the system uh, we do not have to worry about a phase matching because phase matching you talk about whenever you have interaction between two waves okay and uh, the, the next question is uh, is this uh, so just to summarize uh, interaction of electromagnetic wave with uh, phonon is uh, uh, well this is molecular vibrations and the scattered light is downshifted in uh, frequency the gain spectrum is continuous in silica again the process can be a threshold process because what could happen is you could go in with a, a new p uh, you will the system will absorb new p it generates uh, molecular uh, uh, well it, it it excites all the molecular vibrations right and then the next incoming photon can now interact with uh, these excited photons so it, it it can work like a, a positive feedback system just like what happened in a stimulated brillouin scattering so this also is a, a you know a threshold process and the threshold is slightly different in this case it is uh, approximately 16 times a effective by gr, gr is the peak value of the Raman uh, gain coefficient and that uh, multiplied by L effective. Now it turns out that the value of uh, gr is about 8 into 10 power minus 14 meter per watt which is about two or three orders of magnitude smaller than that of a Brillouin scattering process which means in a fiber uh, the strength of the Brillouin process is much more than the strength of the Raman process okay. So the threshold is uh, 0.5 watt which is 500 milliwatt whereas in case of uh, Brillouin scattering we saw the threshold is only 10 milliwatt. So, what would it, how would it impact in a communication system? So, even though it won't turn into a stimulated process, even because of the spontaneous process, what will happen is, uh, if you have multiple frequencies propagating through a uh, uh, fiber, the transmission fiber, uh, because of the Raman scattering, the higher frequency, uh, the, the, the pump, uh, which is the higher frequency signals will start losing uh, power to the lower frequency signals. So, this is in lambda scale. So, higher frequency is lower uh, lambda. So, higher frequency signals will start generating its own uh, Stokes waves. So, they lo start losing energy and these lower frequency signals which is larger lambda signals will start seeing a gain because of uh, Raman scattering. Right. Of course, this gain, this separation should be about 100 nanometer, but this is still, this may not be a problem in a WDM system where you are at only 30 nanometer. But if you are worried, if you are sending, uh, you know, 1300 nanometer, 1400 nanometer, 1500 nanometer, multiple colors through the same fiber, you have to worry about Raman scattering. So, shorter wavelengths are attenuated and the amplifier uh, it and amplifies a longer wavelength. Uh, it takes place in the transmission fiber itself. So, it is not really you do not need a special fiber or anything. The, the existing fiber itself will act like a, a amplifier now. So, that gives us uh, the idea of uh, making use of uh, uh, the Raman process, the stimulated Raman process to make an amplifier. Uh, Brillouin process we did not think about an amplifier because the gain spectrum was very narrow 100 megahertz right that is not sufficient for amplifier for a communication system. But whereas Raman's uh, amplifier is will work very well for a communication system because the gain spectrum is very broad uh, it is about 13 to uh, 20 terahertz ok. So how would you make a Raman amplifier you will send your signal through your transmission fiber. Uh, just to isolate the signal from the pump, you have already learnt that the Raman process happens both in the forward and in the reverse direction. Uh, but just to keep the signal in the pump isolated from each other, you would um, pump it in the reverse direction, 
Now this fiber is the transmission fiber itself. You don't need a specialty fiber. You don't need a doped fiber. So in order to ensure that the Raman process uh, happens efficiently, what you will uh, ensure is that you will make sure your pump is uh, at higher frequency, uh, higher by 13 uh, terahertz or its wavelength is 100 nanometer below the signal frequency. So in order to amplify 1550 nanometer, you will use a pump of about 1450 nanometer and that uh, is the transmission fiber is uh, just sufficient to amplify your signal. Uh, this gave rise, gave rise to this nice idea of uh, Raman amplifiers and in fact uh, Raman amplifiers are uh, considered to be very good for uh, two reasons. One, the transmission fiber itself can work as an amplifier so you don't need an amplifier box. Uh, number two is that uh, you can generate amplification at any wavelength. If you want to amplify 1300 nanometer, you pump in 1200 nanometer as a pump. If you want to amplify 1500 nanometer, you pump in 1400 nanometer as the pump, right? So it is very versatile in that sense. Uh, but the only hindsight is that we saw that the gain coefficient is uh, very small, but uh, which means that the pump power should be much larger than 500 milliwatts. So your system should be capable of handling large powers. Uh, not just that, you would also have to now worry about uh, the Brillouin process in the pump. You are trying to send the pump through the fiber and uh, that is a narrow line pump. So you need to take care of um, doing some kind of broadening so that you can push in all the 500 milliwatt through the uh, fiber. So these are the limitations of Raman amplifiers. Nevertheless, they are used in long haul communication link. Uh, especially in submarine networks, uh, primarily because um, it's very hard to keep digging and putting amplifiers in between. The second thing is also that you can use the existing fiber itself to uh, amplify the system. Uh, there are some benefits on noise figure also uh, in Raman amplifier. We will not go into the details, but uh, they, they, they are not used in uh, regular, uh, you know, um, land networks simply because uh, power handling of these high power pumps becomes very difficult. So they are not preferred for uh, in, in uh, where there is a large requirement for uh, servicing the network. So they are typically used where uh, in systems where once you lay the network you do not disturb something like a submarine network. Okay? So that uh, completes our discussion on uh, nonlinear effects in the fiber. And the last important topic uh, uh, related topic is uh, nonlinear uh, Shannon limit. Remember in the beginning of the course we talked about uh, Shannon limit uh, which tells you the basic uh, limitation in spectral efficiency. Essentially it was it started with capacity and then uh, capacity to uh, bandwidth or the bitrate to bandwidth ratio spectral efficiency as a function of uh, signal to noise ratio. And we said that uh, Shannon predicted that this spectral efficiency is uh, given by this line and we said that uh, for a given SNR, for example 15 dB SNR, the best spectral efficiency that you can arrive is at uh, 5. You will of course you can operate at lower spectral efficiencies but this region is uh, inaccessible. But it turns out that in optical fibers. Uh, this is slightly different because Shannon's lim uh, capacity theorem is uh, written for a linear system. Now, by now we are convinced that optical fiber is a non-linear system. As you increase the power, because the area is small, the intensity becomes large and you have all the non-linear effects uh, affecting the uh, signal that we talked about. So what really happens is as you increase the SNR, the power goes high. And instead of uh, the capacity limit increasing, you will start this degrading. And that is because of all the nonlinear effects in the fiber. Okay? And so in fiber, you have a modified uh, Shannon limit, which is also referred to in literature as nonlinear Shannon limit. So if I am at uh, 35 dB SNR, uh, there is particularly no benefit. Uh, as compared to let us say 22 dB SNR. Okay. So the best SNR is somewhere about around the sweet spot is about 30 dB. 
there is no point in having a, a super nice system with an SNR of 50 dB and 100 dB because that is going to um, violate or the, the, you are going to hit the nonlinear Shannon limit. Okay? So, increase in SNR with increase in power is possible, but it is limited by nonlinear effects. So, uh, do not try to think of building a link with uh, infinitely large uh, SNR. So, roughly 30 dB SNR is the best that you want to aim at. Of course, uh, that will potentially give you a spectral efficiency of 9 bits per second per hertz. Of course, you need to do all advanced modulation formats, polarization multiplexing, maybe mode multiplexing, etc. But um, the difference between a wireless channel uh, and an optical channel, the primary, the other primary difference is the nonlinear channel limit. Mm -hmm.